Hello and welcome to Science with Dr. J. Today is episode number five and the title is Hubble Trouble. Hubble is a telescope that was sent by NASA up in space and when it started its life it had trouble but then the trouble was fixed and what we learned from it is absolutely incredible and amazing and that's what today's episode is about. What is Hubble? Why was it put in space? And what did we learn from it? You know, about uh, three, four hundred years ago, we didn't know that the sun was the center of our solar system. We used to think that the Earth was the center of everything. And that all the planets and the sun and the moon and all the stars are just going around Earth. And this idea or this concept of how the universe was structured was known as the geocentric um, idea of the universe. Meaning, geo means earth and centric means middle. That means we used to think that the earth was the center of the entire universe. Well, of course now we know that it's not true, but we didn't just learn that by accident we had to study over a long period of time to figure that out. And um, one, of, one of the greatest men in astronomy and in science in general, who I would, is considered in general as the father of science and the father of astronomy, is Galileo Galilei uh, from Pisa in Italy. Galileo in 1610 um, invented um, a telescope which is two lenses and a tube and he fixed them in such a way that he could actually see uh, he pointed it to the stars and he could see everything um, that in those days no one else could see because you could see only a limited amount of light with your, with your naked eye. But with this telescope, you could see unbelievable things because it brought in a larger amount of light and from large distances. Galileo discovered many amazing things actually in 1610. For example, he went on the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which is a very famous landmark in Italy, and he dropped two objects, one heavy and one not so heavy, and he discovered that they reached the ground at the same time. That was an amazing experiment, and it showed something mysterious about nature, that actually Earth attracts objects with gravitational pull with it at the same rate. So a heavier object doesn't actually reach the ground before a lighter object, which is surprising for a lot of people, but that's a fact. And it's really interesting how that works. We will discuss that in more detail in other episodes, but that is one of the things that Galileo discovered. He also uh, came up with the telescope for the first time actually as a military instrument because he wanted to help the government um, find out if enemy ships are coming, they want to have advance notice, they want to know ahead of time. So with the telescope, they could see when the enemy ships first showed up in the horizon. And as a result of that discovery, uh, Galileo was uh, respected, became famous, and he was rewarded financially, was giving research money. So he started to, uh, to really do a lot of great things after that time. So, for example, he pointed the telescope to the sun, and he started drawing the sun spots. And he discovered that the sun spots are actually moving. You know, they don't stay in the same place all the time, which means that the sun is rotating, which no one knew. No, no one knew that in those days. Another amazing thing that he discovered was, um, you know, that the moon wasn't just a, a pretty flat disk as people used to think. It's actually a sphere, and it has mountains, it has valleys, it has a rough structure. So, uh, he, and, and he drew that to, with, with, with great care. He drew... He, he had excellent drawings to show how uh, the moon's surface looked. He also discovered that Venus, the planet that is 
second planet from the Sun, the closest planet to Earth, Venus actually had phases like the Moon, and uh, which meant that it must have been going around the Sun and not around Earth, as people used to think. He also pointed the telescope to Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, and to his surprise, he found four moons that went around Jupiter in orbit. So, which means that not everything actually goes around Earth. There are other objects in space that move around other objects and not necessarily around Earth. And that was the first time that this sort of discovery was made and it was incredible. In fact, these are the largest four moons of Jupiter that Galileo discovered and until today we refer to them as the Galilean moons. And of course they are Ganymede, the largest one, and Callisto, and Io, and Europa. And we'll study those in a bit more detail in other episodes. But this was uh, a breakthrough discovery by Galileo. He also pointed the telescope to uh, planet Saturn. And he discovered for the first time that Saturn actually had rings. Well, he didn't know, he didn't know there were rings. Later on it was discovered that they were rings. Uh, or uh, with, with, by other people using more sophisticated telescopes. But at the time, he had a drawing showing that it had two structures, you know, on both sides that looked like ears, and those were Saturn rings. So these are the amazing discoveries made by Galileo. And so then he published a book, and he indicated in that book that Earth is not the center of the solar system, the Sun is. And all the planets go around the Sun. And so the Earth is no longer the center of the universe, but the Sun is the center of our solar system, and we are no longer considered the center of the universe. At the time of Galileo, Italy was controlled by the Roman Catholic Church, and the church officials didn't like him publishing a book and telling people that Earth is not the center of the universe because they considered that, that to be against church teachings. And so, um, 10 years before that, they actually punished someone else by the name of Gior Giordano Bruno, who actually said something similar and he was punished and he was burned at the stake by fire. Galileo was a friend of the Pope and so his punishment was house arrest. They did not kill him, but he was under house arrest for the rest of his life until he died in 1642. So that's the story of Galileo and that was about uh, 400 years ago. Well, fast forward in time 300 years and another great astronomer by the name of Edwin Hubble, as I explained to you in previous episodes, discovered two unbelievable things in 1929. First, he discovered that our Milky Way galaxy is not the only galaxy in the universe and that there are other galaxies in huge numbers besides the Milky Way galaxy. And he also discovered that all these galaxies are moving away from each other, which means that the universe is actually expanding. So these were the two very uh, amazing and important discoveries by Edwin Hubble. About 70 years after Edwin Hubble, NASA built a telescope, and they called it the um, Hubble Telescope. And why did they build it? Because when you have ground telescopes, you have to look at the stars, but light has to travel through the Earth atmosphere. The Earth atmosphere, as you know, is, is going to dis distort the light that comes from the stars. And so the images were not very clear, as you can see in this illustration. The images that came were not very clear. So it was a dream in those days to have 
a telescope up in space, away from the Earth atmosphere. And of course, in those days, it would have been um, extremely unimaginable to even think of doing something like that. And yet, in 1990, NASA launched the Hubble telescope 560 kilometers above the Earth um, where there's space, there's no atmosphere, and so the images that were expected to come uh, through the Hubble telescope were going to be crystal clear and unaffected by the distortion of the Earth atmosphere. Well, <coughs> the telescope proved to be one of the most productive instruments ever invented by man. As you will see shortly, the amount of information and data and in-depth understanding of our universe was simply incalculable. It was unbelievably useful and precious for humanity to gain this tremendous information that came through the Hubble telescope. And that's why I decided to dedicate a full episode just for Hubble because it really gave us a tremendous amount of information about the universe we live in. So, in 1990, as I just mentioned, the Discovery Shuttle uh, went up in space with the Hubble telescope inside it as its only cargo and uh, when it reached the right altitude the doors at the back of the shuttle were opened and the Hubble was slowly released by a special mechanism and eventually within a few hours Hubble was free in space to open our eyes about how the universe looks in a way in detail that we have never even imagined before. So everybody was excited, everybody was just anxious to see what kind of images are we going to get. And the first image came, and there it was. That was a very disappointing image, look at it, it's totally blurred, you can hardly see anything in detail. You could even get better images from ground telescopes. What was wrong? What was the problem? Well, it was discovered that the main mirror of the Hubble telescope, when it was ground, when it was formed, it was two micrometers off. Just two micrometers too flat. What's a micrometer? Well, uh, a meter is one million micrometers. So when you say two micrometers, that means two millionth of a meter off. Just to get you uh, to understand how small that is, if you take a piece of paper and look at the edge, it's one fiftieth of the thickness of a piece of paper. That's how small two micrometers are. It's a very, very, very tiny space. And what's amazing is that there was, in 1990, such a huge amount of accuracy available that they could make a mirror with that kind of accuracy, but even with two micrometers off, Hubble couldn't see very well, which means Hubble was short-sighted, which meant Hubble needed a pair of glasses. So, NASA, over a period of three years, trained seven astronauts and they worked out a special device that corrected these two micrometer um, distance of, of uh, variation in the mirror of the main telescope of Hubble and it took three years to train the astronauts to come up with the corrective glasses, so to speak. And these astronauts went in space on another shuttle mission and they actually fixed the pair of glasses or the corrective lenses for Hubble so it could see again. 
And you know what? It worked. That was an exciting moment for NASA, for astronomers, for physicists, for scientists all over the world, that now Hubble got its vision, perfect vision. Look at the images before and after. And after that, Hubble completely surprised us with unbelievable, stunning, gorgeous, beautiful, amazing images of the universe. Look at this. Planetary nebulae, a star that exploded and it's ejected all of its gas and dust in the space with only a white dwarf left in the middle. If you can see that little tiny white spot in the middle, in the middle of the blue, that's what's left of the star after it died and exploded. And galaxies that are elliptical in shape, we call this the Sombrero Galaxy, and uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, um, supernova explosions, these are stars of gigantic size, and when they explode, they explode with unbelievable violence. Uh, the most violent explosions known in the universe, and we'll study that in, in coming episodes, but because of Hubble, we could see such amazing images of these explosions. We also, there's, a, there's an image of uh, the uh, Horsehead Nebula and the Cat's Eye Planetary Nebula and the Orion Nebula and the Eagle Nebula and many other fantastic and amazing images. This is the Cartwheel um, uh, galaxy. Uh, it's just incredible detail that we never dreamt of having before and now we have it in full detail. So these are the amazing images that Hubble brought to us. This is an example of a spiral galaxy and galaxies that are getting close to each other to collide with each other. Um, so, just a tremendous amount of information and clarity that we gained as a result of Hubble. And then, as a result of Hubble images, we came to um, a more in-depth understanding of what nebulae are, and we kind of classify them into three different kinds. There's a planetary nebula, and the Cat's Eye Nebula is an example, where there is um, a star almost, say, the size of our Sun explodes at the end of its life, when it's dead, when it dies, it explodes and it ejects a huge amount of gas and dust in space and what's left, as you can see here in the center, is just one tiny white dwarf, what we call white dwarf. That's what's left of the star and um, the rest is just ejected into space. So that's called planetary nebula has done nothing to do with planets, it's just a term that we got stuck with from when it was first coined a long time ago. And another kind of nebula is what we call the emission nebula. An example of that is the Orion Nebula, it's an emission nebula. What's an emission nebula? Emission means when you emit, when you send something out. These nebulae, uh, when, when light hits the nebula, the gas and dust in the nebula absorbs that light. Light is energy. It absorbs that energy. The electrons get excited. They go from one orbit to a higher orbit because they have extra energy. But then later on the electrons go back to their original orbit and they give off that energy back. Which means that the gas and dust in that nebula is actually the source of that extra light. And that's why we call it emission nebula. And there's another kind of nebula where the light comes to the gas and dust, but it does not emit any light. It does not absorb it and re-emit its own energy. It actually um, just reflects the light back. And that's why this kind of nebula is called the reflection nebula, different than the emission nebula. Emission nebula generates this radiation and light from within its own gas and dust, but the reflection nebula only reflects the light that it receives and it does not emit of its, any light of its own. An example of that is the Witch Head Nebula. And then another kind of uh, uh, detailed information we have as a result of the Hubble images is understanding the different kinds of galaxies. There are four different structures or kinds of galaxies in the universe. 
One example is the elliptical galaxy. That means the whole, all of the stars are arranged in an ellipse, and the center has a huge, big, very bright bulge of a huge number of stars. And that is called the elliptical galaxy. And a good example of that is what we call the sombrero galaxy, as you can see in this image, because it looks like a, a Mexican hat. And the other kind of galaxy is the spiral galaxy. That means it has spiral arms, as you can see in this image, and the center is also a bulge of tremendous amount of stars, and so ge generate a tremendous amount of light, as you can see in this image here, and that's a spiral galaxy. Another kind of spiral galaxy is the barred spiral galaxy. As you can see here, in this galaxy, the, in the center of the galaxy, the stars are not one circular bulge, but arranged in a bar, you know, in a rectangular shape. So we call these the barred spiral galaxies. And there are other galaxies that just look irregular. They're not elliptical or circular or um, spiral. They're just irregular shaped. We just call them the irregular galaxies. So these are the kinds of galaxies um, that we see in space. And thanks to Hubble, now we understand that and see it in great detail. Well, we also discovered that uh, uh, stars don't necessarily always within the galaxy stay apart from each other. Sometimes they cluster, they come very close to each other, and they, they, this is what we call a globular cluster. Globular cluster means a group of stars that because of gravity came closer to each other and they stay within, uh, uh, I can't say short distances because they're huge distances, but relatively short. In cosmic terms, they're short distances, but they're not really short. They are in the trillions and trillions of kilometers away from each other. But they stay close to each other because of gravity, and we call it a globular cluster. But we also discovered, because of um, uh, Hubble, that galaxies can actually, because they're massive, massive uh, amount of stars grouped together as one galaxy, the amount of mass is huge. And of course, when there's big mass and big mass, gravity pulls them together. And believe it or not, galaxies also come closer to each other because of gravity. As you can see in this image, this is just, just an illustration. Two galaxies, they bend or they curve uh, the space because of their massive weight. And so they start getting closer and closer to each other because of gravitational attraction. And here's an example of two galaxies coming close to each other, ready for a collision. And many, many other examples of galaxies, as you can see here, that actually um, come close to each other. Some of them on the way to collide, some of them already collided, and some of them in an advanced stage of their collision. But when we say galaxies collide, we don't really mean a real collision. It means the stars kind of join together to form a new galaxy it will be extremely rare for two stars to actually collide directly with each other because the distances, as we said, are huge between them. For example, here in the Milky Way galaxy, um, our solar system, our star, uh, the Sun, is, is um, 4.3 light years away from the closest star. So the closest star to us is 4.3 light years away. That means 43 trillion kilometers away. So, and that is the closest one. So you can understand now when there is a collision of galaxies, uh, it means that the stars just join together to form a new gigantic galaxy, but uh, there is really no direct collision between the stars. Um, they, they may, it may happen, but it would be extremely rare because of the huge distances between the stars. The closest galaxy to our Milky Way galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. The Andromeda galaxy is believed to be um, uh, larger than our Milky Way galaxy. I think some astronomers estimate to that, that it would have close to 400 billion stars. And our galaxy, Milky Way, has maybe 100 billion, 200 billion stars. 
So the Andromeda galaxy is coming on a collision course and we are moving towards it and it's moving towards us at huge speed and as you can see um, in the text that I put here for you to see it's the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away that means the light that comes from the Andromeda galaxy and we see it here today left that galaxy two and a half million years ago it took that light two and a half million years to come from the Andromeda galaxy to reach us right here in, in, uh, on Earth. So it's very, very far. And so, but it's moving at, at high speed. It's moving at 110 kilometers per second. 110 kilometers per second is very, very fast. Imagine, I mean, close, close your eyes and say number one, already covered 110 kilometers that's extremely fast and yet with going at this amazing speed it will still take about four billion years before the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy will actually join together to make a huge gigantic tremendous uh, galaxy and um, that's going to happen maybe in about four billion years approximately um, our Sun will still be alive because our Sun is going to live for five billion more years so the Sun will still be there um, and it will uh, definitely be um, affected it could be ejected away from the whole galaxy formation into space or it could assume a, a new position we don't know uh, it it could possibly go to right to the center where it's really dangerous as we will learn in other episodes or it could stay in the suburbs in the periphery away from the action as we are right now in the Milky Way so that we are in a nice and safe and and not so dangerous area of our Milky Way galaxy we don't know what exactly the calculations will show in the future perhaps with more accurate simulations and calculations we may be able to predict but um, by then of course um, even earth will uh, will not be habitable it will not be possible to live on earth anymore why is that well because the sun gets warmer and hotter all the time and so in about you know, by the time it's four billion years from now the sun will be so hot that the earth will be you know all the oceans the water in the oceans will be completely evaporated there will be no life on earth left uh, hopefully by then humanity would have been advanced enough to have gone to other stars to colonize other planets so we will not uh, will not be extinct here's something else that uh, Hubble could achieve watch this if you take an area of the sky that is completely black not a single telescope on the ground will be able to see anything in that area of space completely black NASA astronomers and scientists pointed the Hubble telescope to that small area in the sky that is completely black and let it gaze there for 100 hours just gaze fixed on that area for 100 hours let me give you an idea how small that area is how tiny if you take a tennis ball you know not very big about this size and put it 100 meters away from you can you imagine one tennis ball 100 meters up in the air above you how much can you see behind that tennis ball of the sky not very much very very little it's a hundred meters away that is the area of space behind a tennis ball put 100 meters away from you is the area that Hubble gazed at and that's amazing look what it discovered it discovered more than 10,000 galaxies in that small area of space 10,000 galaxies it's incredible and this image is one of the most important images or discoveries of Hubble and it came to be known as the ultra deep field image 
okay ultra deep field because it is very deep and very far and focused image on a small area of space and yet it found about 10,000 galaxies in the ultra deep field image let me just show you some amazing things about Hubble for example Hubble weighs as much as two African elephants about 12,000 kilograms 12 tons okay um, Hubble orbits Earth at about 28,000 kilometers per hour okay so that means it can go completely around Earth in 95 minutes one and a half hours it makes a complete turn around planet Earth in one and a half hours now in order to understand the other amazing things about Hubble I want to explain to you a couple of terms or measurements that we use in space or in astronomy they're called the arc minute and the arc second let me explain to you what this means as you know a circle is made of 360 degrees 360 degrees in a circle okay now if you take one degree and divide it into 60 smaller parts each part is called an arc minute okay so 360 degrees in a circle one single one of those degrees divided into 60 smaller parts each part we call it an arc minute now take one arc minute and divide it into 60 even smaller parts this is called an arc second so a degree is one out of 360 degrees in a full circle an arc minute is one out of 60 parts of a degree and an arc second is one out of 60 parts of an arc minute which means that an arc second is actually 3600 times smaller than a degree on a full circle it's very small okay so now we understand arc minute and arc second so now watch this Hubble when it points to the stars how accurate is it? It is as accurate as 0 0.007 arc seconds. Remember, an arc second is 3,600 times smaller than a degree. Okay? So, 0 0.007 arc seconds is like two millionth of a degree. That's how accurate Hubble is it can point to uh, a star with the accuracy of two millionth of a degree it's incredible that we have technology that has reached this level of accuracy and that we can put together and build this amazing machine that can do these wonderful things put it 560 kilometers up in space and it can do all these, all these amazing things that is really incredible so um, here's something else watch Hubble oh let me let me tell you something else about uh, Hubble before I move on the two millionth of a degree accuracy what, what's an example that can make us understand that better Imagine if you have a coin, you know, money, coin, and you put it 300 kilometers away. Just one simple coin. Put it 300 kilometers away up in space. Can you imagine that? And still be able to see it. That's the accuracy of Hubble. I have to take my hat off to these incredible engineers at NASA who could come up with this design and actually make it reality. That is mind-boggling. I understand why I'm in love with science. When you know that we can do things like that, it's just uh, totally amazing. So here's something else. Watch. Hubble can see astronomical objects with an angular size of 0 0.05 arc seconds. What does that mean? It's 0 0.00014 degrees. 
that's how small remember a degree is three, 360 times smaller than a full circle and this is 0 0.00014 degrees or 0 0.05 arc seconds you know on the NASA website I found an excellent description to help us understand how accurate and amazing this is imagine if there are two fireflies two fireflies you know flies that fluoresce produce light imagine if they are 11,000 kilometers away from you so for example uh, I am now sitting here in the eastern part of Canada and imagine if I can see sitting here two fireflies in Tokyo Japan that is unbelievable it's totally incredible if I can imagine if I had eyes that can see two fireflies apart and they are I'm sitting right here in the eastern part of Canada and yet those two fireflies are as far away from me as Tokyo and I can see them it's fantastic Hubble is only about the size of a school bus about 13 meters long so it's not much bigger than a school bus okay and the mirror the, pr the main mirror the primary mirror of Hubble is two and a half meters in diameter actually 2.4 meters in diameter okay and over 24 years that Hubble has existed Hubble made more than 1.3 million observations of our universe including our solar system 1.3 million observations can you imagine the amount of data the amount of information precious valuable tremendous detail about our universe that came because of Hubble now how does Hubble change its direction it spins its wheels you know when you, when it spins its wheels according to Newton's third law of motion every action has an opposite reaction in the opposite direction every action has a reaction in the opposite direction and so when it spins its wheels this way then it moves in the opposite direction and this is how Hubble is steered and maneuvered and moved you know uh, when scientists publish research information when when they when they publish their findings we call it a research article okay 14,000 research articles have been published as a result of the data and information that came from Hubble from Hubble that is that is how much value we received out of the Hubble telescope and um, this data that Hubble gathered all over all these periods of times is tremendous because in one year it can gather as much as 10 terabytes of data that is 10,000 gigabytes that's 10 million megabytes that's 10 billion bytes in one year so that's a tremendous amount of information gathered by Hubble about our universe and you know Hubble went around planet Earth 150,000 times uh, which which is almost six and a half billion kilometers distance and um, what's really amazing is that Hubble revealed to us galaxies that are 13.4 billion light years away from Earth 13.4 billion light years what does that mean imagine what that means that means when light left those galaxies and we just saw it today that light left those galaxies 13.4 billion years ago almost at the beginning of the age the early stages of the age of our universe and Hubble discovered that and Hubble, Hubble showed us that so what's the end of Hubble well late in 2018 
Hubble will be retired because it's been it would have been in operation for 25 years remember it started this journey in 1990 it was repaired for the first time in 1993 it was upgraded a few times since then so it's about 25 years of service so a new telescope by the name of the J James Webb Space Telescope uh, is built by NASA will be ready late in 2018 and will replace Hubble and it will be able to see farther with higher accuracy and more depth and higher resolution and I can't wait I can't wait to see what kind of fantastic more detailed information we can receive uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope late in 2018 so that's uh, I, I decided to give you this story because I thought it was a compelling and amazing story about the triumph of science and technology in enabling us to learn about the universe things that our ancestors never even dreamt of imagining or seeing and uh, uh, the wheel of progress continues and other more amazing things are coming and I just can't wait and I'm really excited that I can live in this privileged time when we know these amazing things about our universe with such tremendously incredible technology um, what I will do next time is explain to you about how stars are born so our next episode is episode number six is a star is born explaining how stars are born how they live and why they die how they die what happens after they die that's our next episode so thank you for joining me please continue the journey with me so that we can continue to learn together about the universe and uh, please subscribe tell your friends and uh, let's have a lot of fun thanks for jo joining me today and we'll speak next time bye bye